Hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope you're doing awesome. I am honored today to be hanging out with somebody that's going to answer a ton of super great questions for us that are such a time where unemployment is, you know, um, rising. Hopefully now it's dropping down a little bit. But I am honored to hang out with Sarah Reed from Moonstone Coaching and Consulting. How are you today, Sarah? I'm great, Dave. Thanks so much for having me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So coaching and consulting can mean so much. I share some of those titles as well. Where do you focus your day-to-day -day activity with your, uh, with your company? Yeah, so I work with folks in two different categories. People who are typically in corporate America who are trying to figure out what to do next, right? They're feeling a little stuck, a little lost, maybe lacking some confidence, need some clarity around how to move forward. So they need help on the emotional side of the job search as well as the tactical side. So I help them move through that in a number of different ways. And then the other side of my business is helping people navigate corporate America, right? They're not necessarily looking to make a job change. They want some external support um, outside of their organization that can help them navigate their career typically within the organization, like moving up, they may be a little younger in their career or on a leadership track and want some external support to help them work through that. Awesome. So you have those four words that I hear all the time, what to do next. I mean, that is so, you know, it's so hard, right? I mean, it's, it's a big so question. It's a yeah. huge question. Gosh, it's mm -hmm. so hard to unpack. I mean, you know, when I'm in, when we talk about employee engagement and two out of three people that show up every day to work are not engaged in what they do, you know, so I try and help people to, you know, um, help them find and discover what it is that they're great at, you know, whether through assessments or, you know, coaching, things like that. How sure. do you answer that question? If I come to you or we have a listener right now that's going, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need. I don't know what to do next. I, whether I don't like where I'm at or I'm not at anywhere, but I don't want to go back to what I did. So are there some simple, you know, um, starting points for you, Sarah, that you feel comfortable sharing with, with that person that might be listening right now? Sure, sure. Um, to me, it actually goes back to why I started doing this work. So I'm going to back up a little bit if you're okay with that, Dave. Um, I, I was in recruiting for a long time um, in HR and in the staffing business. Uh, and what I saw was people, I interviewed a lot of people over my career. I could tell people would come to the desk, right, sitting on the other side of the desk of me. And I could tell, I'm not sure this is really the job they want, right? Like, I know they can do it, right? And it's what they have done, but I'm not sure it's really what they want. Sure. So this has always been in the back of my mind before I launched my business. I kept seeing this gap, right, of people coming. And it's almost like they look at a job posting, for example, and say, I can do that. I can do that. Right. I can do that. Right. Yeah. Like just line by line. Like, let me look at my resume. Let me look at my job description. It matches with this one. Let's do that. Right. And I think the crucial step that a lot of people are missing, especially as they move on in their career and their life and their beliefs and their things shift in their mind and in their environment is they don't really look at the foundation of themselves, right? They skip the, that crucial part of saying, who am I right now? What do I want? What do I want for my work and my life so that it all works together? Sure. Uh, and they just go straight to the job search process, right? Let me get my resume in order. Let me run off and, and cause they want to run away from their current gig, right? Yeah, they're yeah. so, they're so anxious to get out they miss that crucial step. So that's a lot of the piece that I do with my clients that can, someone can do on their own, right? Like sometimes sure. people need help, but really looking at those key pieces of what do they want for their life, that foundational pieces and facets of themselves before they start applying for jobs and saying, I can do that, I can do that. Really doing some of that kind of self-examination. Wow, and that's interesting because I, we spend a lot of time <clears throat> when I'm coaching my business clients on self-awareness. So. Mm -hmm. You know, so often, like you said, we want to skip that. That's like, you know yep. what? Give me something. The hard stuff. <laughs> give me something other to do than that, Sarah, because the last thing I want to do is invest time because I want to go interview. Let's just go, right? Yeah. You know, and I was raised, you know, don't just stand there, do something, right? And now I'm learning in kind of to reverse that and don't just do something, stand there, mm -hmm. you know? And it's one of those situations where it's like, you know, until you understand to what you just said, until you get a little bit more comfortable with yourself, you're really, you know, I look at it as you have a ton of capabilities. People have capabilities, they have abilities, 
but is that really what you want to, you know, live and die by on your resume? And I've been helping, you know, a couple friends here and there, and I look at their resume and it's like, man, boom, 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 all the things they can do, not who you are. It's not who, exactly. It's not a reflection of them. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing I see on resumes that's lacking is there's no vision or idea of who they are. Do you start and help people then with that? Do you start, you go all the way back to, hey, let's kind of, you know, here's what you got resume wise and then let's, you know, unpack that a little bit. Do you, are That's you- usually the last thing we do together, really? actually, right? Oh. So that is part of how I work with my clients, right? Okay. But we do the, I always say I work in three different buckets, right? Confidence, clarity, tools, and resources, right? Okay. So the confidence and clarity is the coaching side of my business, right? Okay. Where I'm helping them uncover and asking questions and doing some exercises or assessments with them. Sure. And then the tools and resources, the tactical stuff, right? You got to figure out what you want to do, who you are first before you can add it on paper, right? So okay. I feel people are, that's always what they're so anxious to get to. I'm like, hold on, it's time out need a little patience. Let's get to, let's get to, because all of that feeds into your resume. That's how you make your resume um, a little more alive and a little more reflective of you, the human, but you have to answer those questions first and do a little bit of that work first before we can get to that tactical side of things. Wow. That's awesome. And I think that's, so you talk about confidence. I mean, when you are talking with somebody, I got to believe, and I'm, I've been honored to My first job, my first company I owned, I was there for 28 years, sold that. This, my coaching business here, I've been for eight. So I kind of don't know what it's like to be on the interviewing side. I, (laughs) right. But it's like that confidence. I remember the confidence that I, that I had in transition from selling to starting because I start the business and I'm like, I have no clients. And like the first client that I was supposed to have was my past business partner. And I'm like, he asked me to, if I could, you know, I said, I, he said, I want to be your first client. And I'm like, Jim, you don't listen to me now as my business partner. The last thing I want is my first client to not listen to me. So I like turn that guy down. Right. So here's me, new business, nothing to do. And I'm turning people down first one. Right. Second one doesn't pay me. So I'm like, man, like confidence is like, it's rattled. in. It's hard. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's tough to, to start and grow a business. You know, what, are, there some, are there some simple things for anybody that might be listening that you could, you know, offer from a confidence perspective to just kind of, you know, boost their confidence a little bit that you can think that, that would work for them? Sure, sure. One thing, my, all my friends, all my clients, all my colleagues, my network know what I'm known for is watch your words, right? And what I mean by that is making sure that you're, what, and what I mean by watch your words is your internal dialogue, what I often call gremlins, right? Okay. The, the negative thoughts that go through our mind, um, the ones we would never say to other humans, but we say to ourselves all the time, right? So yeah. really paying attention to what you're saying to yourself, right? Sure. And kind of you were saying about the client that you turned down, right? That you had the business owner. And instead of saying like, oh, wow, I did that it's more thinking like, hey, I did that for the best reasons, right? And I know in my gut, that's the right thing for me to do. And I am confident that I'm going to move forward in the right way. Because if I would have gone down that path, it probably would have led in the wrong direction, right? The other little trick I like to, because I'm all about like quick tips, right? How can we make life easier for ourselves? Um, Replacing uh, get with, I know I'm going to say, I always flip it around. Replace should with get right? So I get to do this instead of shooting all over yourself, right? Like everybody knows somebody who's like, oh, I should do that. I should do that, right? That word should has such bad energy, right? It's just kind of heavy and it's kind of like a wet, a wet noodle or a wet brick. I'm terrible with analogies, right? But you get what I'm going for, right? Blanket, that's what you're looking for. That's what I was going for. Thanks, Dave. (laughs) Oh my God. Classic for that, right? But instead of like, I should do my resume. I yep. should go apply for that job. I should go follow up with that client. I get to, right? Yep. You think just that simple word tr- right. trick, the, it's like, oh, I get to go on vacation. Oh, I get to call my client, right? right. It's just yep. a little bit of a shift for your mind yep. that can make a big difference. Those are two of my big things that I'm on my clients all the time about because I find that we are much kinder to enemies and strangers than oh. we are to ourselves sometimes. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wrote down have to versus get to before you even said it because uh-huh. I remember years ago when we used to have to do trade shows 
and it was downtown Milwaukee and it was like, you know, it was, it was probably a beautiful day and I'm driving sure. down there and I'm like, the, this, on a Sunday morning or some crazy thing, this is like the last place, Sarah, that I want to be. Let's just be real, right? Yep. I'm battling this on my mind down there. And for some odd reason, it kicked in like, why don't you say instead of you have to go, you get to go to your point, you know? And ever since then, that's the same scenario that I've been trying to help people with. You, you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know nope. what? If you don't want to go to work, don't go to work. I mean, it's not. There's you know, consequences, but. <laughs> exactly. There's totally consequences. However, in this case, you know, if you can't change that to, ha you know, your have to go to get to go, like you said, that that's so powerful. And I love that you said, watch your words, those internal words, mm -hmm. because what we think inside ends up what we believe. Exactly. And boy, you know. That's why, like, when, it's so funny when we do disc training, you know, with personality profiles and we're in a room, we just did this Wednesday with a group and there's, there was nine of us in the room and we go around the room and we, on the disc, it says what value you bring to the organization, for instance. So, you know, it's so much easier for people to point out what they do bad mm -hmm. rather than for them to point out what they do good. And so I think that that's so cool, especially in a critical time that you're dealing with people in this transition. Normally, you're probably p working with people that are, again, not working or super unhappy, you know, mm -hmm. with where they are on that side. So those are really two cool ideas. And once you build that confidence, then how does the help us with the clarity piece? How, how sure. do you bring clarity to somebody that's unsure what their next step should be? It's usually a combination of those two things. The confidence and clarity, they kind of go together, right? As you become a little more confident, it's easier to get clear in your mind, right? Because it's not being weighed down by that negativity you've got going for yourself. Okay. So it's, it's a combination of conversation, right? And, and back and forth with the client, as well as doing things like values and getting to the root of really examining what they're saying to themselves, right? Like digging far in more than just watch your words, but really digging into that conversation about what are they saying themselves. I often give as homework to my clients, you know, write down or keep track in your head, whatever you feel comfortable with before we meet again, what are the things you're saying? Because usually when we sit down and talk about that together, you can see this theme and this pattern that you as you're going through your day, you don't realize it. But once you put it down on paper and you start talking about it with another human, you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, crap. I see it right there. You don't even need to tell me, right? <laughs> well, I'm not telling Sarah this. There's no way in the world I'm admitting to Sarah what I just said. Well, you, I can't tell you how many times my clients say, I really don't want to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> Well, but that's a great point. So I love the journaling piece because so often in today's world, the last thing we really want to do, right, is journal. We don't want to write things down. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting because I'm, I'm starting my second book on blind business blind spots and awesome. I'm actually writing it in, you know, I have a, bind, a, a, yeah. a notebook and I'm actually writing rather than typing. Typing. It's just easier for me. So, you know, certain people have, you know, that some people are easier with it than others. Do you find a lot of people are journaling or is that part of this discovery for you is to, to journal and invest some time in, in prioritizing the thoughts and things like that? It usually depends per client, right? So I cater my work depending on my client. So it also goes along with what they're most comfortable with, right? Where they feel like, they're going to get the most value. And I'm fairly intuitive, so I can tell what's going to work for them, right? Because I don't want to push them into something that they're not going to do because it just doesn't feel right. So sometimes it's full-blown journaling. Sometimes it's like, take this week to write these things down, right? Like, so I agree. I'm a big believer in writing things down and doing those exercises. Sometimes I have people do an exercise to kind of purge some negativity they've got going on in their workplace or their life is literally free writing, it's a really good exercise for anybody out there that is struggling with something. You take some time. You have to write it, right? Because there's some science. I think it's 14 more neural pathways get connected when you write something versus typing. Mm, so it's really important you do some free writing about whatever the situation is, probably at work, that's bothering you. Write it all down. It doesn't have to be coherent. doesn't have to be complete sentences. Literally, it's just to pull it out of your brain. And then I recommend that you burn it safely or like rip it up and put it down the river. 
okay. right? The whole thought process is to release it from your brain because oftentimes part of what's contributing to people's confidence issues, right? Or lack of clarity is they've got too much spin in their brain and it's often negative spin. So literally the act of writing it all down until you have got, you've got nothing else to say about that particular situation is a really effective tool to release some of that bad juju, for lack of a better word, right? All that gunk going on yeah, in there. Yeah. So does that mean that if I'm understanding it right, so let's say we're spinning in a negative direction, in order to spin in a positive direction, we have to kind of stop and then, you know, make that transition into positive. Well, that stop is really that, in your way, writing that down and then releasing that into wherever, burning it or whatever you end up doing with it. So is that, are people have to be like, seriously, Sarah? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I get that all the time. In fact, I vividly remember one client. She's like, okay, Sarah, we've been working together for a while. Yeah. I trust you. I'm going to yeah. do this. Yeah. Right. And her situation, she was in her role for 25 years. She got laid off mm. and she, it was a really big devastating blow to her, right? Sure. Both sure. emotionally and professionally, it just hurt, right? Sure. And she, we were talking through things, we were doing some work and it was still, I could feel like I could feel that weight in the way, right? It was wow. gonna get in the way of her interviewing, it was gonna get in the way of her networking. And so that's when I suggested this, I'm like, just trust me, give it a shot. And she's like, okay, I do trust you. And she came back the next session, she's like, oh, it was really helpful. Right. She said, I cried. Right. It was yeah. a good release. Yeah, exactly. And I think the difference you had mentioned journaling before yeah. I'm a believer and I like to keep things that are more positive in a journal. Right. Cause you're holding on to what you want. Right. Sure. Versus the negative stuff. I don't love holding on to that. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer and I don't, I think it's a good practice to write it down, sure. but then I want you to let it go. Right. Oh, gotcha. That's why in this example, it's about not in a journal, it's on paper and it goes away right? So cool. that you mentally see the activity of it going away as opposed to holding on to it, right? Because if okay. you think about it, a journal you kind of carry with you, it sure. might be nice and pretty. So I'm a believer that you want to be careful about what you put in something as permanent as a journal versus what you just write down so that you can release and let it go. Wow. So now I'm going to go totally psychological because I know you have this degree in psychology. So let's I'm thinking I've been known to be called a career therapist before. Oh, happened. that's awesome. <laughs> I'm thinking like for tapping is that, I mean, I'm thinking mm. of like it, you know, and I've experienced that before where there was like a thought in my head that I just, for whatever reason, I couldn't get out of there. Yep. And it was crazy how there's opportunities in psychology to kind of re uh, I'm going to say erase and then rewrite those tapes so I don't know if that, those are the right words, but those, that's kind of how it resonates with me. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because in that process of getting a job, and mm -hmm. I sat and interviewed enough people for various clients, companies, I mean, I've been hundreds of interviews like you have. Sure. You can tell, I can tell, you kind of get that sense of the confident person versus the person that's scared to death. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know, so for somebody that is maybe not a good interviewer, do you have any simple tips for them that, that might help them the next time they have to interview at least to, to kind of get some thought around that? Yeah, that goes back to why the resume is the last thing I do, right? Oh, With people, sure. it goes back to because doing some simple things to get clear on you, right? It could be just go, going on Google and looking up a values exercise and reminding yourself of what's important to you, right? And being really clear, I like that as a tip to kind of get more comfortable and grounded in an interview, mm -hmm. is to make sure you get a chance to say, hey, I really value knowledge. So I love the fact that your organization really puts emphasis on employee development, right? Sure, sure. So making sure you have those values, right? So it's truth or knowledge, whatever your values are, getting clear on those, because for one, I think it serves as this grounding purpose, like this is me. It's a reminder of this is me. And I feel like so oftentimes people go into an interview and they're so focused on what have I done? Where have I gone, right? Like, what do I need to do for this company? Yeah. If you just remember who am I, breathe. I'm a big believer in remembering to breathe. Sure. And be able to infuse a bit of that. That can really calm you down, right? Because in the end, right, I, I interviewed since I was 17 years old. Right. I started recruiting when I was 17. Wow. I've done it a lot. Well, that's been what, four years now? Yeah, four years. Four and a half, actually, Dave. Okay, four and a half. <laughs> awesome. Um, but really, if you can just be calm, right, 
And even if you don't answer my question exactly, if you give me pertinent information, I'm like, okay, I'm good, right? Like I never ding some, and some interviewers were, then it's probably not a place you want to work, right? But if you're giving me valuable information, remember that I just, the whole purpose of an interview is to get to know the human, right? It's yes, it's about skills, but it's also, are you going to be a culture match for here? Are you going to like working here? Are we going to be like working with you? So the more you can remember to be you and show that a bit, the better off you are. And I find just remembering that can calm people down through the process. Instead of getting so worked up about, I got to make sure I answer this question, this question, this question, it can get really mind numbing. It's very stressful. Yeah. That's so interesting. And I think of like when I tell people, any of my friends that ask, I'm like, the reality is, is you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Absolutely. So the hope here is really to kind of find out and see if there's a connection. So Mm -hmm. I've I've interviewed some people and they've interviewed fantastic or, you know, I mean, who, who wants to admit they can't do something in an interview. Right. And I always love when people used to say, when I'd say, Hey, so tell me about a weakness that you have, you know, they'd be like, Oh, I care too much. I work too much. You know, (laughs) it's always one of those like really funny things. But I think that what you just said, right now about culture, you know, we have to determine if it's a fit. I mean, you know, yeah. I, when we use the uh, disc assessment and I, there's a, a page that says what your ideal environment is, you know, and where you're going to thrive the most. And so I think of it like if I take a rose and I plant it in sand and I water it once a month, it isn't going to do good. Just like if I take a cactus and put it in dirt and water it every single day. So, you know, the, neither the dirt is bad, nor is the sand bad. It's just the person, or in this case, the plant, you know, it wasn't in the right spot. So how do you work through that? Are you telling people up front to, to ask like culture related questions to get? Absolutely. Absolutely. Unpack that for us a little bit. Yeah. It's funny when you were talking about your uh, your um, cactus example. I have a, a good friend of mine that I worked for for a number of years together. Her favorite phrase was "There's a hat for every head," right? And it's the same kind of thing, right? That it's really about making sure you're clear about what you want in an organization, and then either through a combination of research, right? I believe it's a couple of different strategies, right? It's a combination of your own research. It's a combination of having some conversations with people that have worked there or know somebody that works there, any, whatever you can get access to, right? Sure. And then asking some actual questions in the interview. You, you know, you can't just rely on the interview itself to get that kind of data and information. Right. I think it's important to look at it from a couple, couple different angles. So you really feel comfortable that like, okay, what they're saying is really what I'm seeing, right? Because oftentimes I think I've, I've had clients that went into an organization and thought it was the right fit and then come to find out later after doing some more digging after they took the job that they realize like, oh yeah, not a great culture. Oh yeah, that's not a great fit for you, right? Yeah, and so sure. you really got to make sure you do your diligence on, on both sides, both during the interview as well as kind of on the outside in that research phase. Wow, that's so cool. So how do you, because as, as you were painting that picture, I'm thinking in my head, how do you not be like egotistical? How do you not make it all about you? Because it's so easy for us as somebody that's trying to get a job somewhere to like take over the interview, dominate the discussion, you know, make it all about me. So what do you, you know, what do you do around here? You know, you can make it so it's so easy for us to kind of, you know, there's such a fine line of, I want to learn more about your culture because I want to make sure that I fit in there, but it's not, it, it, how do you make it not about me and more about us and more about the team? Yeah, I always remind people that let the interviewer, right? Like that HR person, that hiring manager, it, they're driving, right? I literally tell that to clients. Remember, they're driving, let them drive, okay. right? So that works both ways because I have a lot of clients that they they struggle with that kind of boasting part of the inner, right? That because their confidence is a little bit hard. So yeah. I always tell tell clients that if you are struggling, answer the question, let the interviewer say, hey, can you tell me more about that, right? Because what I see, it's not even um, from an ego, from a nervous standpoint, they, they ramble too much, right? They, yeah. Like, and they can't stop. And I coach people a lot on that. I'm like, no, stop. 
Right. Shut the lips, right? One on one (laughs) sentence, right? Exactly. Let them ask a follow-up question, right? Let the interviewer do their thing and you do your thing. Because I think sometimes people try to do both sides when they come into that interview. And and it's remember your place, and I don't mean that in a bad way, just like it more from a a, this is to help you relax, right? Do your thing have your questions, let it be more conversational, and that's gonna be a better outcome for you, the interviewer in that job in that uh, job interview. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, so when we do our listening skills training and when we do our, you know, master the art of questioning training, sure. for me, I, my, one of my props is a chip clip. Mm-hmm. You know, the things that chip clip bag because yeah, totally. that, mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know what, take yeah. that. And put it on your mouth because you talk too much. I don't care who you are. The vast, vast majority of people tend to, you know, not really listen, but, you know, they're, they're formulating their response to the question. And I think that's so, I mean, interviews, they're so hard, right? I mean, you you got this little bit of information time to really make a huge difference. And then you have to remember that there's probably four more people after you or before you, you know, that are in the same boat and you're trying to make this huge impression. And so I think, especially if it's anything to do with a sales role, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. then we have to talk way more, right? So it's yep. just like, you know, so I try and encourage people in business in general to just, you know, listen to people and and have these killer questions that draw out that information. I mean, you just brought one up. I mean, my favorite my favorite three words are "tell me more" mm-hmm. because it really puts the onus back on whoever a prospect, you know, client, whatever. It really makes somebody open up, and and so I I you know I I feel comfortable sharing that with people because we want to open up, and especially in an interview man, you know, that's, you, you get one, like you said, you get one yep. chance at this, right? And so, that's yeah. so I'm just curious, you know, when you're, are you guys ever, um, we hate the words role playing, but we, but I, so I erase that from my, from my words and I in use the word practice. And yep. I was just going to say, I use the word practice yep. too. Yep. Yep. So <laughs> do you guys practice at all? You Absolutely. Know, that kind of stuff. How, how does, I mean, people, do you videotape that even worse? Or do you I don't mean? videotape. I haven't had anybody request that. I wouldn't be against that sure. um, because I will typically be very kindly blunt if yeah. I think that visually they are doing something wrong, right? I can sure. just think of a client that I had, I was helping him do some interview prep and I'm like, I'm just confirming that the face I'm seeing now with the baseball hat on is not the video interview you're going to go to, (laughs) right? Like I'm just confirming, (laughs) right? So I always, I've been kind of nicknamed a truth teller because I believe that if, if I'm not telling you the truth, why, why should we be working together? Right? Like I'm doing you a disservice if I'm not being honest with you, but so I typically do that. Sometimes it's via video when I used to work in person. Right. Um, but it's, I can hear a lot in the, during the phone call, even if it's not a video of being able to give them some thoughts and some comments about what, how can they can tweak things. Yeah. And I'll never forget one of the window manufacturers that we had to be involved with. We took a tour and they literally in one of their level two or level three sales training, they actually videotaped our presentation. Mm. Sarah, I never thought that I would ever recover from that. Yeah. Because I looked at it and I thought I, you know, I, I, I've been doing this forever. You know, I know what I'm talking about and boy, I tell you what, I had ticks and I had, um, uh, eye contact issues. Sure. You know, I had, I wasn't listening. I mean, oh, I just, it was just painful to watch, but I tell you what, it really makes you get a hold of yourself. If you're serious about your, you know, personal and business development, which again, that's on your, that's up to whoever's listening. But if you're up, if you're up for it, that's a huge way of really making a solid change in your, in your life. So absolutely. And I am, I'm always a little careful about that because depending on the circumstances, my client may have an interview in a day, sure. right? Yep. And them to watch a video, yes. will, it'll take them weeks to recover <laughs> yes, from that. Exactly. I'm like, we don't have that kind of time, right? Yep. Like, so, right. so it's, yep. it depends on the person, right? Yep. As to, I totally agree with you. Yep. Oftentimes the, 
timing in which I'm dealing with people, the best thing I can do for them is to give them that feedback, the ticks, the things like that, so that they don't have to emotionally take it and see it because it's a different, I, I agree, it's really effective. But yep. if, they're, if I know they're going to an interview in two days, I'm like, they're not going to be ready by then. It's going to take them for yep. too long. Absolutely. We got to do it this way. And if they're not close to a trauma center, it isn't going to work because I tell you what, it, it is. It's so life changing because yep. we all have this thought. And, and I had this guy on one of my trips once and it was fantastic. We do this tour. And at the end of the tour, they, you know, they take snap a picture of our group and they email the picture and he looks at his picture. and goes, you know, I look a lot better in my head. <laughs> and I thought that's so brilliant, you know, and that's what I think, you know, everybody's, you know, I think I'm way better than this. This ain't me, right? So I can totally get that that's the case. But I tell you, there, you know, that practicing piece is makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. I, I, especially like when we do sales training, I tell people, and I'm highly suggestive of please don't practice this on a prospect because, yeah. you know, that's an expensive arena to be practiced dangerous exactly yeah you know the the baseball players i mean you're not seeing the brewers practice swing changes you know they're doing that before the game they're doing it after the game yep. in the game you know when you're in front of whoever you're trying to you know uh, make a connection with you have you got one chance and the best way to do it is you know to to be yourself and try and, and make that connection authentically so so that's interesting. Do you use any type of assessments at all? Do you have anything that you, any tools like that? Yeah, I have some things that I use as part of when I was um, certified as a career coach a number of years ago. Um, part of that certification uh, was given some exercises and assessments. So I use those and I use um, some things that I've divide up, devised on my own. Okay. Um, oh, I have a nice little fly. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but flying yeah, around. Yeah, flying around. Yeah. It's delightful. Um, that I use that um, they're much more tactically based, right? So, so many of my clients come with assessments and they're like, for the, for the niche that I'm in, they come and they're like, yeah, I know this is me, but it still doesn't tell me what I want to do next to my career, right? Okay, sure. So, the things yeah. that I do are much more exercise based to gotcha. serve as brainstorming and to kind of uncover and dig into what are some possibilities. Gotcha. So, a little different than I find that for me in my space and my niche, uh, hardcore assessment is really great for an organization and help them sure. figure that out. But you, the being right now trying to figure out what you do next, does, I haven't found one that I love that works. So that's why I use the ones through my, I got through my coaching certification and what I've come up on my own. Gotcha. Cool. Do you use like EQ at all, get involved in emotional intelligence at all to try and help them Understand. I talk about that all the time, right? The awareness piece, the, yep. all those things, a lot of what, um, like if you think about doing the values exercises is a, is a key to thinking like, okay, that's right. Who am I? And let me get more sure. introspective about what I'm about. Like that alone is a really valuable thing that you can do to say like, oh, that's right. This is important. Right. And if I value this, am I behaving in that way? that is in alignment with that or is in my is the organization i work at in alignment enough with my values that this is a good fit cuz that's often how people come to me we do their values and it's so clear right they value knowledge the company doesn't value that or what have you right they're right. they're not flexible and they value flexibility and you see where the unhappiness came from and where the um uh, you know misalignment is cool so i have a question which is we're switching completely into something that like i like the word I like, what's career smackdown? <laughs> I totally like that. I'm totally like, I got to- goes along with that whole truth teller thing, right? Okay. So I'm honest with people. Like, I'm not going to tell you things that feel great all the time, right? Sure. Like, because again, I want to help you in the fastest way possible, right? And sometimes doing that in several sessions over a long period of time is not going to get you where you need to go faster, right? Mm -hmm. So I am- kind in my smackdowns but i will tell it like it is and it'll hit you in the middle of your eyes right right here um but i will do it with a kind open heart so that you can take it in but that's really what that's that's all about it's it's really easy when you're smiling at me to hit me in the face right like exactly I'm, totally that's my strategy yeah <laughs> I'm just supposed to be like, oh my gosh, do that again. That was so much fun because you were- And so many of my clients are like, oh, I feel this coming. Like, oh, I feel it coming. I can tell by the look on your face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so is it, um, 
I mean, so what I do, and I am, I'm going to get your take on this. So sure. when I start a relationship with a client, I tend to ask, especially when I'm when it's in a coaching role, you know, I ask the question of how, how real do you want to get here? You know, I mean, I, my words are a little different and it's a little longer discussion, but the reality sure. is it's like, okay, how brutal do you, how brutally honest, not brutal, but how brutally honest, how open do you want this to be? Because, you know, if I come in as, you know, if I come in as a coach and I see something, what do you want me to do? I mean, there's plenty of things I can do. I can offer suggestions. Yeah. I can tell you exactly what's wrong. You know, I mean, how do you want that? Do you find that you ask something similar or how do you address that early on as trust is being built between you sure. and a new prospect or new client? How does, how yeah. do you do that? So it's, to be honest, it starts with my initial conversation with the, with a prospect, right? In that consult conversation, I'm really clear about, Hey, I'm a truth teller. I tend to be really honest because I want to make sure you get where you want to go. Okay. So I kind of lay the groundwork for that. Okay. And then in our initial conversations, part of it is just me gauging their comfort level with, you know, transparent communication. Um, and typically for me, it's like, Hey, I remember you say you want to, move forward and move on to this organization, right? So for one of those clients, right? Sure. And that's still really important to you. So that's typically what I start with when I give them some of those smack between the eyes, right? <laughs> in order to do that, you need to do X, Y, or Z, right? And that's where the hard feedback comes in, right? So it's usually me, a combination of, hey, I've reminded you that this is how I operate. Like, yep. and you gotta be comfortable with that because gotcha. this is the only way I know how to do this well. Sure. Because I'm trying to get them to move somewhere, right? Different than when they're in an organization. I think that's some different dynamics, right? Sure. sure. Um, so it's that. It's then telling them, like, hey, I'm reminding you, this is what you said you wanted. Okay, if you this is what you want, I need to give you this feedback. Sure. And that's typically how I lay the groundwork for that. And then as time goes on, they know it's more of like a look from me. And then they're like, oh, yeah, okay, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's how it evolves. So. Oh, there you go. So I want to just um, touch base real quick on the people that are currently employed that you're working with, but yet are potentially, you know, not enamored mm -hmm. with their current situation. Um, you know, I've read that like three out of four people are leaving their job currently because of their boss. I mean, are you hearing a lot of this disgruntlement? And again, obviously with the COVID, it's a little bit unique, but sure. you know, just in general, you know, I, I'm just curious, if, if, are you seeing a, uh, if we were polling your clients as to why it is that I'm not satisfied with this particular job? Because I'm thinking there's entrepreneurs listening that, you know, they, they have a great team, you know, and when I wrote my first book, Growing on Purpose, it was because I see a lot of people that grow by mistake. Sure. I wanted to kind of create a pathway for people you know, to find how to strengthen their team. Well, part of strengthening that team is that two-way communication. And quite frankly, if I have a team and somebody's not able to be forthright with me, uh, there's already a gap there. There's yeah. already something going on. So do you coach people? I mean, when someone comes to you for the first time, Sarah, and says, I don't want to work here anymore. You know, I'm assuming you kind of unpack that is it, are people Absolutely. trying to justify their themselves on why they want to leave or are they coming with authenticity going, maybe it's me, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to kind of have you unpack that. Sure, later. sure. No, I think that's an excellent point. And that was one thing that surprised me when I launched my business uh, that not everyone ended up leaving, right? Because part of the work I do, I believe you need to get clear you need to get in a better spot in your current environment, right? Before you can go out and interview and figure out what's next, right? Sure. If you don't get your head on straight at your current place, yep. then it doesn't work, right? Because you're bringing all that with you, right? Yep. Or that baggage or that cover is preventing you from getting clear. So I had a number of clients and still do to this day. Most of them do come to me and say, hey, I think it might be me, right? Because I think they're coming for coaching because they think like there's something wrong here. It's possible it's me, right? So they're coming to me with that, that lens a little bit, okay. but oftentimes it is about shifting their perspective, knowing that some wells don't have water, some wells have soda, right? Like that's what I find with leaders oftentimes, right? That, that person is going to that leader for something they can't provide. 
Okay. And they get mad about it. I'm like, sure. dude, you got to just deal with the fact right. they don't have that kind of water in their well. Right. So find it somewhere else in the organization or then it is time to move on. Sure. Right. So it is oftentimes a lot of conversation about them getting clear on, do I really want to leave? And is this about me? And what do I need to shift? and what some perspectives I need to take. A lot of it, you mentioned, is driven by manager relationships, right? Yeah. But I've, I've had a number of clients that have turned that around by doing their own work and decided to stay for a while and haven't left sure. because they realized they needed to shift their perspective and their view on things and watch their words um, to make sure that they were doing the right thing for themselves. That's so cool. And we actually, it's funny because I use a stress assessment for people and it kind of, it, it, it shows seven different areas in the workplace where stress can rise up and it gives you some tips and stuff sure. to work through that. You know, one of them is your manager or whatever, supervisor, whatever your words are, leader, you know, and, and, but that's only one. I mean, there's so many other mm -hmm. stress points in a day. So, you know, when I, when, when I talk with people, whether I'm talking to the business owner or someone on the team and that stuff comes up, you know, my first thought is what blind spots do we have? You know, what are we, what are we not seeing, you know, and what are we making decisions on, you know, nothing worse than making a decision on half the information. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I do a ton of conflict resolution training and actual conflict resolution between two people. And if I only heard one side and then I said, okay, we're going to make a decision based on yep. that. We got this. We can move forward. Yeah, exactly. That's how, but that's how we as humans, a lot of times make decisions based on like half of the information. Yep. So, you know, um, that's where I think it's interesting. So on your end, how do you like when, if I would come to you and I had that blind spot, I had that, you know, I couldn't see what you're, what you see, you know, and cause that's what a coach does, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. can see what I can't, how do you coach them into, you know, being able to better understand or better see that situation? Uh, probably the biggest thing is helping them get curious, okay. right? Instead of reacting, getting curious, right? So I'm a big fan of the question, what if, right? Okay. What if your boss meant this? What if he or she has this going on, right? And throwing out a number of different scenarios is how I start to help them think about that, right? Sure. Like it could be their mother got sick yesterday, right? Like all of the scenarios of why someone might be behaving badly, right? So that you can get curious about it first and then have more empathy, right? Sure. And then re react, right? Get really analytical about it, right? And thoughtful about it instead mm -hmm. of just, because I find so many people just react, right? And that's yeah. not always beneficial. Sure. Um, to them, you know, behaving well at work, quite frankly. Right. So that's typically my process and how I help them work through that. But curiosity, I always, I, you will hear the word, cre be curious, get curious, what if, all the time out of my mouth to coach them and to encourage them to not just react and sure. automatically assume something. That's so cool. And that's where, you know, I mean, when you think about the empathy thing, I mean, that's a whole nother topic to to unpack at a different time, but I remember listening to a story about a guy on the subway, and I don't know if it was a true story or if it was just to make it. Sure. But there was a guy in the subway, and he had two kids with him, and he was sitting there just kind of in a, in a daze, and his kids were just running around the subway, you know, in that car, and they were just, you know, like they didn't even have a parent. Sure. And somebody came up to the father finally and said, Hey, seriously, man, you know, control your kids, right? <laughs> you know, you got it. This isn't acceptable. This is the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the guy looks at this guy and says, you know what? I'm really sorry. I know I just left the hospital and we just lost our wife, my mom, the mom, you know, and I'm just like lost. I mean, if that would have been, because I could just, I could see myself, right? Like yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking, man, get control of your kids, right? But hopefully I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm reacting I'm, to that right away, right? Yep. Able to, my emotional intelligence is enough to where it's like, dude, maybe something's going on. To your point, what if something was going on? And I think it just really brings home that point of asking that what if. And quite frankly, give people the benefit of the doubt for yep. once, you know? Absolutely. I mean, my gosh, it's, you know, it, now more than ever in our society, how cool would it be to get the benefit of the doubt you know, more than just, you know, make a quick judgment and, and we're all done. And, Isn't that real? Yes, absolutely, Dave. 
So I, I love the fact that, you know, I'm trying to find ways to open up people's minds. And I think I love some of the tips that you, you know, shared today. I'm definitely going to incorporate some of those into my training, if you'll let me. And I can absolutely, I can send you a royalty check or something <laughs> just to, to call it fair. So, so I didn't create this on my own, Dave. You're totally good. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. No, I thought this was all your own stuff. Now time out here. Oh, forget it. Uh, it's my own spin, of course. Yeah, but. Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> There's right no original idea. Isn't that how it goes yes, or something exactly. like that, right? Yep. <laughs> cool. Well, as we come in for a landing, I just want to ask you, so if we would create a, if, if you were going to give a tip of the week, you know, something for somebody listening, just, and it can be on whatever, it can be whatever, you know, wh wherever it takes you, what's one tip for somebody listening that you really think would be helpful for them? To be honest, I think it's be kinder to yourself. Okay, awesome. I, I think especially in these current times, just the things I see from my, it, be kinder to yourself, right? Because yep. I think that we're all in a tough spot right now, whether it's in business or looking for a job or dealing with your family, that if we could be kinder to ourselves, it's easier for us to be more patient, more curious, more empathetic, right? If we can put that kindness inward, it's a lot easier for us to behave better outwardly um, because I just see that as a theme lately. Yeah. So again, and that goes along with watching your words, right? Be kind, yeah. watch your words, you know, don't say something to yourself that you wouldn't say to your friend, your best friend, right? Like yeah. don't do it. Yeah. And that internal that, that I wrote, I mean, that's really, you, you called it an internal what? I can't Gremlins. Remember. Gremlin, okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. And I'm like, did she yep. say gremlins? That's awesome. Yes, I did. <laughs> awesome. You need like you need to create like a, a, a stuffed gremlin. You need to get that and travel with that because Oh sure. <laughs> I tell you what, I use the magic eight ball a lot. Remember that whole back thing? I oh use, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I use Mr. Potato Head. I mean, I use as much as I can because people are so visual. So yep. I would love to partner, you know, let's go on Shark Tank. <laughs> and let's get the gremlin and let's just, you know. There you go. So one last question for you. What's one thing that most people don't know about you that you feel comfortable sharing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that, quite frankly, I'm an introvert, right? Most people think I'm an extrovert. And I am, I recharge by myself. And I come off as really outgoing most of the time, but I'm like, whoo, I'm tired after that. So most people are very are surprised to learn that about me if they don't know that about me. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. I love that because, you know, I, I'm the same way. I, I you know, and I, I, most people laugh when, when they, I say that to them, mm -hmm. I'm more of an introvert and people are like, well, how do you know the difference between an intro, if you are one or the other? And for me, I know, that like when I go into an event, like, you know, whatever, a networking event, let's say, mm -hmm. and I, I give everything there. I leave it all there. I'm, I, I'm done at the end and I'm like drained. Of energy. Yep, exactly. I want to go home. And with, if my wife happens to be there, she's the exact opposite. She's an extrovert. She got so energized. Yep. At networking time. She's like, man, we Rare to go. more stuff, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, are you kidding? I'm done. And it was amazing <laughs> to really understand that because people would never believe, I would never have believed that you were an introvert until you mm -hmm. said that, you know, again, but then you think about, Hey, you know, after the fact, boy, you're just drained because you left it all there. So, you know, when you're speaking, when you're out networking, yep. oh, I see you all over the place. And when you're doing that, I'd have, uh, for me personally, because I do a lot of that as well, I realized after my speaking, I have to like, if I like, I go to a state or you know, and speak like back to back or something. Yep. Mm -hmm. Boy, that couple hours after, I I try so hard to stay engaged in whether it's an association, trade show, company. Oh, totally. And I'm just like, man, hard, wow. really hard, really hard. So, so that's awesome. Thank, thanks for sharing that. If people want to learn more about you, Sarah, they want to learn more about Moonstone. They want to, you know, maybe, um, you know, learn how to have you work with them on, you know, this coaching piece. What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Sure. Um, you can go directly to my website, which is okay. moonstonecoachingandconsulting.com. Awesome. Um, all spelled out. No, I know it's a long URL, 
rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> or through LinkedIn is another good way. Look up Sarah Reed at Moonstone okay. is another option. I'm also on Instagram at Moonstone Coach. So um, any one of those ways are good ways to reach out. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I can't wait to do this. If you're not doing this internal gremlin thing, I might, um, you know, take that little uh, stuffed animal and turn that into one. So <laughs> that, that is so cool. And I have gonna... to dig one of those up. That's a good point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so if you do, let me know if I find one, I'm going to let you know. All right. Awesome. I love it. I have one. I have this guy right here, but this guy here, he laughs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's, but he's not a gremlin, but he's a funny guy. So awesome. Thank you, Sarah, awesome. again, so much. I, I learned a ton. I'm sure our listeners learned a ton as well. And I hope if they have more questions that they'll reach out to you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you around. Hopefully soon we'll get yep. back out and live in person, right? <laughs> start doing some speaking and start, you know, doing some more live trainings. And until then, keep yourself and your family safe. And, and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Dave. Good to see you. Take care. Thank you.